Welcome to the CEO's Open Discussions Corner at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today is a very special interview, a rare chance to sit down with a commodities expert and a natural resources legend who has been around since the 1980s building successful businesses. Our guest today is Mr. Rich Munson. Typically, he does not do many public appearances, but his interview with the SGT report last week got the company attention from investors who want leverage to spot gold prices. Rich is the CEO of Sand Spring Resources, a Canadian-listed junior gold mining company. Today, we will be focusing upon several key aspects of the United States economy, which seems to go unnoticed by the mainstream media. Rich, welcome to the show. How are you today? Very good, Michelle. Very good to be here. And uh, Welcome the opportunity to uh, talk to you and uh, your other uh, viewers, listeners. Such an extraordinary time for precious metals. Yes, it is. Very exciting. We're going to start off with some prices for your first question. Gold prices have outperformed stocks for 18 years. Gold began this century more than 60% lower than it is today. It is up nearly five-fold since 2000. Not the same with stocks, though, which measured by the S&P 500 have still not doubled since the year 2000. In fact, the index is up 66% in 18 years. Cisco, which was the darling of the dot-com boom, has not even returned to his price from the year 2000. Rich, why have the tables turned so much? Are American businesses to blame, or is it too much government debt? What are your thoughts? Well, the level of debt that has been amassed, if you will, <laughs> uh, both in the U.S., and globally is just, uh, it, it's mind boggling almost. 21 trillion uh, for the US, and we're at the highest percent of GDP I think that we've ever been in terms of the ratio between debt and GDP. Other countries that have to repay debt in US dollars have just been really hurt, but yet they've all incurred tremendous amounts of debt. Worldwide, um, you know, we we're, we operate in the South America, and the little country we're in does not have much debt. But the neighbor to the south, Brazil, is in extraordinarily tough times. Farther south, you see Argentina in even worse times. As we're part of a truly a global economy, the contagion that happened many years ago with the failure of some South American economies is looking to be right on our doorstep again. And the U.S., the U.S. Uh, continues to print money. I hope we can get that under control, but I, I saw a commentator say uh, recently that the only thing that he was certain of in 2019 economically was that the debt would continue to rise. And I think that's true. So you mentioned the very solid alternative that gold provides in terms of the alternative and the strong long-term growth profile. And that's where gold has a significant value because it, you know, it, it spikes, but is it going to drop dramatically? Uh, the values of real estate, things like that, historically not at all. So is gold a safe haven as it's always been looked at? Certainly. And should we be looking at safe havens, at least as to part of all of our investment portfolios, I think safety is something that we need to be thinking about today. Absolutely. And right now it's in a, it's in a low. It's an extraordinary buy. It's something to jump on, actually. It could well be. Certainly the stocks of gold mining companies are tremendously undervalued vis-a-vis the price of gold at the moment. They've been lagging. And yet the leverage of owning a company stock is so much higher than owning solely the commodity. For example, if gold increases by 10%, say from 1200 to uh, 1320, that same amount 
could be per ounce if I'm a gold miner and I'm producing several million ounces of gold. Wow, the impact on the bottom line of a 10% change in the gold price is immense. And you can see what can happen to the value of a gold company's stock with that kind of a change in the commodity price. And fast. Very fast. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to leave off that point. A quick <laughs> moving quick. business, yes. <laughs> now, Rich, the dollar is as strong as it was back in 2002. And we are certainly seeing the USD at its best since 2011. And yet, gold is trading at all-time highs in 72 different currencies. We know that only 0.83%, that's less than 1% of the investing community actually buys gold. Why is it that investors have forgotten about the precious metal that used to be owned by virtually every person walking the face of the earth for thousands of years? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's something of a cultural change. Uh, you know, the folks that my parents, for example, and those are, they've been gone a long time. I'm not a spring chicken by any, any, uh, match, but, uh, I'm still energetic and still working hard and enjoying it. But in any event, they wanted tangible things that they could look at and hold and understand this value. And that kind of has kind of gone away, uh, in, uh, recent history. And certainly in the most recent history, beginning in, say, December 2016, there was a mantra that developed that gold is dead. And you heard many commentators talk about it at length that there's no reason for gold anymore. We don't need it. Uh, the U.S. dollar is as good as an ounce of gold. So I think, though, as all of these challenges that we face on the the world eco economic uh, front, if you will. Uh, world uh, Bank says that the world economy is going to slow, not have much growth. They're not overly optimistic about the U.S. long term. Uh, so I think everybody needs something that maybe is a little tangible, that does hold its value. And so I think you're starting to see, even today, I saw three articles on uh, one website about how much people should be looking at putting at least a portion of their portfolio back into gold, gold or gold stocks. So I think we're going to see some renewed interest in gold and for some very good reasons, frankly. Oh, yes. Yes. It's going to be an exciting time here. And I, I don't think it's going to be too far in the future. Now, Rich, let's talk about where you personally come into the picture. In the 1980s, you were a part of a private company, which was the largest uranium producer inside the United States. And since 1999, you've been instrumental in advancing a project in South America that nearly 20 years later has become the largest one ever held by a small cap company. Now, what does it take really on a personal note in terms of effort, personal sacrifice to take a company public with an asset in the middle of the jungle through a timeline of nearly two decades? <laughs> Well, that's maybe a matter of uh, debate, uh, <laughs> Michelle, but, uh, you know, I'm reminded when you talk about uh, 20 years that uh, recently we, we did a new uh, corporate presentation and the lady that was helping me put it all together put a little tagline in that uh, there was committed management at uh, Sand Spring Resources. And when I made a presentation a little later, I said, you know, there's two schools of thought on this phrase, committed management. Some people look at it and say, yeah, 20 years, these guys really are true and honest and sticking to their guns to get this done. There's another school of thought that says these guys should be committed, oh. <laughs> uh, not, uh, not uh, rewarded for what's going on. How could anyone for 20 years? <laughs> 20 years in the jungle. Uh, you know, I... It has been uh, challenging, but 
you know, I have one of those uh, personalities, I guess, that, uh, and I benefit from my upbringing. Uh, my parents were hardworking uh, farmers, ranchers, and uh, we worked hard, but uh, we were proud of that. And when we had a commitment and a challenge in front of us, we worked harder to get it done. And this has been a challenge. I'm committed to getting it done. I will get it done. I'm confident. Uh, but yes, there's been challenges. When the, the market fell apart, we uh, were very challenged. And, you know, I've had people working with me for 20 plus years. And I had to terminate some of those people because we just didn't have an ability to raise any money. And in the worst of times in 2015, to keep Sandspring alive, I was drawing down on my home equity line of credit here in the house that I own uh, to fund Sandspring. Now, fortunately, when a shareholder came in and, and invested in this, they helped me get that repaid. Uh, you know, I was able to say to that group when we closed the transaction that they did two things that day. They saved Sandspring resources and they saved my marriage. So, <laughs> right. uh, at least they, they gave me the house back to uh, live in. Right. And, She's like, uh, okay, <laughs> get it together. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough to have a spouse that's been with me for 40 years. Oh, wow. And uh, so that's been of immense help to me as well. Uh, she jokes that part of the reason, and I hope she's joking, but she says part of the reason that we've stayed together for 40 years is I'm gone all the damn time. Oh. <laughs> right, he's out in the jungle. So, it's so important anyway. to have that behind you, 40 years of marriage. That's yes. true stability through a very unstable business. Yes, yes. Now, we had been talking a little bit off camera before the interview about what's happening in Guyana. Um, many times when mining companies go into countries and many people who aren't familiar with mining hear about it, they think of destruction because that has been the past. And you're very unique. I want you to talk about something that you've put together um, for the country of Guyana, the hydro. Well, it, yeah, and it, it, it's part of kind of a philosophy, Michelle, that uh, we learned and and uh, committed to when we were in the uranium business. And as you know, uranium is not a popular thing. Uh, nuclear power has its issues. There's no question about it. But we focused on mining the uranium, but also putting the properties back in pristine condition. And we earned many rewards from the federal government from the state governments where we were operating for best reclamation projects, et cetera. And we just picked up those same kind of commitments and ideas and took them with us when we went to Guyana. And what you're referencing that I was talking about when you and I were talking uh, off camera is one of the things that the mining industry needs to really try to focus on at in a more concentrated area, and that's looking at long-term environmental impacts of our operations. And so one of the biggest impacts that mining operations have is burning fuel oil, diesel to generate electricity to operate the mines in these remote locations. There isn't a power line anywhere near uh, the Toroparo project in Guyana closest one is uh, 200 miles away. So initially we looked at generating all of our power through burning diesel fuel. Now we're looking at and have agreed with government that we have the right to develop a hydroelectric project quite close to our mining project. And by doing that, we, one, admittedly we saved the company a lot of money in operating expenses over the life of the mine, uh, if, uh, uh, our estimate is half a billion dollars. Wow. But most importantly, we will be using a renewable resource, water. All we're doing is diverting that water into a generation facility. It's called Run of River. So we don't build a dam. We don't uh, relocate people. 
And then by building this facility, we'll also be able to provide electricity to those very few local communities that are there in the area that now either have no electricity or they burn enough diesel a few hours a day to have electricity. So it's win-win for the environment, for Sand Spring resources, and for the local population of Guyana. That's so beautiful. Free electricity. It's what the whole world wants anyway, <laughs> bringing it to the folks in the jungle there in Guyana. That's, that's extraordinary. We're, now, we're very proud of that. Yes. Um, I want to take us back to Sand Spring Resources. Um, it's the name of your company, and shares yep. now trade at an eight-month high. But compared to the value of 2010, it's a mere shadow of itself. Um, back then, gold was at $1,800 per ounce, and the company was worth $400 million. Today, its value is at $60 million, which is an 85% reduction. We know that this is a cyclical industry and that they tend to detach themselves from fundamentals. So talk to us about what has been going on behind the scenes since 2010 to illustrate to us how Sand Spring Resources has sort of maneuvered through this cycle well I look at I look at the days of uh, 2010 11 and even into 2012 they're what I call the days of wine and roses and uh, companies that were in the precious metals business because as you said price was moving upwards towards eighteen hundred dollars were darlings of the investment community and we were we were highly valued the reason we got to such a value is in that time of increasing gold prices, our project resources, the size of our project, went from 3 million ounces to close to 10 million ounces. So as gold prices were going up, shareholders and investors could see the tremendous leverage that owning shares in Sandspring could bring in an increasing gold price economy. So we did uh, did very well. Did very well. Yes, you did. <laughs> uh, I uh, unfortunately I still own the same shares I owned when we went public in 2009. So I didn't capitalize on any of that. But uh, I guess maybe that's one of those challenges that you you face in this business. Mm -hmm. I uh, I believe that management need needed to be invested. I'm still invested, still trying to participate in, in additional investments in Sandspring. But what's amazing to me, Michelle, is I look at the project now versus the project that we had in 2010, and we are so much stronger and have such a lower risk profile than we did in those years that it's just amazing. Over that period of time, we've gained three financial partners, very significant players in the industry. We have taken the project from early stage economic analysis to nearly final feasibility work. Uh, we've published a pre-feasibility report. We will be publishing in the next uh, 60 to 90 days information on new additional work that we've done in the last two or three years, including this hydroelectric project and the significant impact it has on our operating expenses. If you look at what we've invested in this project, Michelle, it's about 150 million US dollars. And we have a market value of, as you say, about 60. So there's been a lot of hard dollars, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears invested in the project. And it's poised to reward everybody who has been with it a long time and who gets into it at this incredibly low valuation. Yes, it is. It's extraordinary time. Now, Rich, you just mentioned that you have some very heavy hitters as shareholders, such as Forey Group, um, Wheaton Precious Metals, and Grand Columbia Gold. This is amazing. Could you please tell us the story of how that happened? Because it happened during, shall we say, the low cycle of the industry. It did. It happened when uh, gold companies weren't even talking to other gold companies. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to know it. <laughs> developing properties. Everybody had their head down. Uh, 
Wheaton Precious Metals was the first company to recognize Sand Spring and recognize all the work in the Toro Paro project. And for those of your listening and viewing audience that don't know much about the Wheaton story, they're a phenomenal company in the what's called the gold streaming business. And they buy rights to uh, secure part of a company's gold production over the life of the mine by providing money up front to help uh, the company construct the, the project. Wheaton is very unique in the sector in that they are well known as having a top-notch in-house due diligence team of engineers, geologists, economists, etc. Most of the other companies that are in the sector hire consulting firms to do their work. And Wheaton is known as doing not just good due diligence, but incredibly thorough due diligence. And if you look at the number of projects they do, you would see that they value the quality of their projects, not the number of projects they're in. They don't do projects very often. And in fact, Sandspring was the first junior development company that Silver Wheaton invested in. And so they agreed to take a position in the Toro Paro project. They're not a shareholder, but we have what's called a streaming precious metal purchase agreement with them. And they will contribute a certain percentage of the upfront capital expenditure costs for developing the Toro Paro project. So they've been a great partner. They've stuck with us through the tough times. Uh, they're excited about the opportunity that's ahead. We're very pleased and proud to have them as a shareholder or as a participant. The other two groups, the Fiore group, Fiore's investment uh, success over the years has been quite phenomenal in the mineral resource business. And so uh, when they, they approached us in 2015 and they had commissioned their own in-house engineering team to go out and canvas the market and find a project that would be the cornerstone of Fiore coming back into the gold sector. And they picked Sandspring as the first uh, project. They told us the criteria was one, it had to be big, and we are. We're over 10 million <laughs> ounces of gold. Uh, two, it needed to be in a stable jurisdiction. Guyana is a stable jurisdiction. And three, they told us, and I hope they thought so, that they were looking for a group with some long term competent management. And I think we fit that bill. Uh, others may not, but uh, we're here and uh, working with Fiore Wheaton. And now the third member of our team is, as you mentioned, Grand Columbia Gold. Grand Columbia is a, an amazing story. They have put together a very successful operation in the country of Colombia. Uh, they're producing over 200,000 ounces of gold a year and on target to expand. One of the things they want to do is expand in South America, looking for other projects, they were aware of Sandspring for a while. Finally, when they did some recent financing last year in 2018, they came and said they wanted to take a position in Sandspring. And they've become our single largest shareholder. But the most important thing to me that they have brought is a team of highly skilled technical people that have had experience in building very large gold mines in the world. And so that's just incredibly important uh, to us. And they're doing that to supplement their investment in Sandspring. So I don't have to pay that entire technical team huge fees to help us work on this project. So this trifecta of financial and technical support makes us a very unique story in the junior development company sector in the gold business. Yes, it does. Could you just revisit those numbers one more time on your size? We have a total, what's called a global resource of 10.5 million ounces. An important component of that is we have proven and probable gold resources of 4.1 million ounces. So 
we can produce under the pre-feasibility plan, we produced roughly 250,000 ounces of gold for 16 years. Now, we, ex we intend to extend that life of mine and uh, produce gold for a longer period of time and produce cumulatively more gold than we had analyzed in the early stages of the property's development. So on, under a recent analysis done by one of our financial advisors, Sandspring currently holds the largest development or the largest resource of gold in South America that's owned by a junior development company. That's just extraordinary. When you hear junior gold company or small cap company, <laughs> You think, you know, so this, that's huge. Yeah, that yeah, is, we're that huge. is an immense amount of gold. Now, Rich, what are your company's tickers and where do you trade? We trade on the Toronto Stock Exchange, the Venture Exchange, and our symbol is SSP. We trade in the U.S. on the OTCQX and our symbol is SSPXF. Awesome. Now, what's next? for Sand Spring Resources. How can investors measure the leverage they could potentially get to gold prices? Well, you know, as we've, we've talked about, I think there's greater leverage in owning stocks of gold companies than there is in owning the commodity. And the reason why is that increase in gold price goes almost 100% to the bottom line. If the company you buy can produce gold at less than what the prevailing market price is, and that market price for gold goes up 10%, that all goes to the bottom line almost immediately. So it, it's tremendous leverage to an improving gold price. We think we're going to be, with the addition of the hydroelectric plant, a low cost producer, and that we will have all in sustaining costs that put us in a very attractive position going forward. Those are the key things to be looking at. The amount of gold that can be produced and what does it cost to produce it. And we think we're, we've got an ability to excel in both aspects of that. Beautiful. Rich, this has been an amazing interview. Thank you so much for coming on this show today. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Now, what is your website just before we leave for everybody? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm glad you <laughs> reminded me that I should be <laughs> at least providing that information. It is sandspringresources.com. Okay. And it has a lot of information on it. Great, great. Mr. Rich Munson, the CEO of Sand Spring Resources. For the CEO's Open Discussions Corner, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. Check out trending interviews right now. Harry Dent, the famous deflationist who predicts single-digit silver and has now changed his tune. Greg Manorino with a no-holds-barred interview where he lays out his top ideas. Trace Mayer goes ballistic on crypto doubters. Jeffrey Tucker explains the details of crypto. Portfolio Wealth Global has published the only report online that deals with exactly how to thrive through bear markets in gold and crypto. Go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash bear now. Oh, my God.